please, what is the consensual or socially perceived necessities approach and how it can contribute to the construction of public and social policies? Thank you very much. Um, the consensual approach has been used, has been developed over 40 years in the UK, in the United Kingdom, and has been used around the world to reflect the lived social realities of people um, in all these different countries, whether it's from Australia to Sweden to Japan to Uganda or South Africa, across all of these different societies, the consensual approach has been used as a method for people to reflect nationally defined or democratically defined measures of poverty. It goes beyond the monetary, single monetary, money metric measures of poverty to reflect people's needs for housing, for healthcare, for education, but also not just material deprivation, but also social participation deprivation. Are, able, are people or are communities or families able to afford uh, to give gifts, to give presents at Christmas to their families, to give um, presents for weddings, which are very important social activities, which are common across all societies in the world. Traditional economic measures of poverty tend to be quite narrowly defined, reflecting, say, a proportion of the national minimum wage. In Brazil, it's about 960 reais per month. So a poor family would be on less than half of that proportion. Now, obviously, that's a very low level of poverty, but there are other needs that are not met. Uh, children may be able to go to school or have access to health care. The quality of these services will probably be very poor for people living in poor communities. And so we want a measure that can reflect both access to and the quality of these important services for their everyday lives. And the consensual approach asks um, a representative sample of the population what they think are important or necessary that everybody in society, everybody in Brazil should be able to access. And then we build a deprivation index on the basis of those people who cannot afford these different items or activities. Not by choice, but by a lack of resources. That's amazing. So, uh, you have published a wonderful paper examining child poverty in Korea but by constructing a multi-dimensional child poverty index in dialogue with the Sustainable Development Goals, right? So, would you tell us about the rights-based approach you have taken in the past with regards to poverty research? And in particular, with work you've done on child poverty for UNICEF around the world? Can you please? Okay. Um. I suppose the story goes back first with the work with UNICEF, where we were asked when I was when I was working in a, at the University of Bristol with Professor David Gordon um, and Professor Peter Townsend, uh, we were asked by UNICEF to come up with a way of reflecting child poverty in the whole world. Up until 2003, there were no distinct estimates of child poverty for the developing world or for low and middle income countries. So UNICEF, obviously, with its interest in the needs and rights of children, said, "How do we reflect that?" So we found a way of linking it up to the Conventions of the Rights of the Child from 1989 that set out quite clearly what children's rights were to a basic standard of living, to education, to healthcare, to access to water. And we linked that up with an internationally agreed definition of absolute poverty from the 1995 World Summit on Social Development that defined absolute poverty as severe deprivation of basic human needs for water, shelter, sanitation, information, education, healthcare, and food. So we were able to use nationally representative, high quality data sets from over 50 countries to produce measures of deprivation to reflect children's needs for those different, those different basic needs that we set out. The, the rights-based approach is slightly different but linked quite closely in the sense that we were focusing more on economic and social rights rather than civil and political rights. Children don't have a right to vote, and you can identify whether someone's right to vote, say, is infringed by whether or not they are allowed to vote or not. Economic and civil rights, sorry, political and civil rights have this one or zero element to them. They are infringed or not infringed. But what about economic and social rights? What does a right to health care mean? What does a right to education mean? Okay? So we were able to take a rights-based approach to say, okay, an infringement of a right would be if a child has never been sent to school. They have a right in their constitution to go to school, but have never been to school for whatever reason, whether it's due to poverty, whether it's due to racism, whether it's due to other structural causes. 
but we were able to reflect what proportion of the population of children in country A or B had their right to education infringed. Similarly, when we developed the Child Poverty Index, we were able to say, okay, this would reflect whether a child's right to an adequate standard of living has been infringed, if they are poor or not poor, according to the way that we do it. And what's important is not just our measure, but the fact that our measure using the consensual approach or using international standards or using international legislation or national legislation reflects agreed normative, agreed norms and normative standards in the country in question. Okay? So there's no point in saying we would want everyone to be able to go to university if there is no right to that. We would like obviously many people to go or to get a secondary education. Um, and so the rights-based approach provides a means for organizations like UNICEF or advocacy groups within a country to press for the rights and the needs for children and for the allocation of resources and the development of policies and projects to meet the needs for their children. The work that we did in South Korea was, from a, was using a survey that included a number of questions by UNICEF Korea, UNICEF South Korea, that was able to look at children's rights to material items, but also social um, participation items, whether or not gift giving or um, events after school or school trips. And we were able to show that while a relatively low proportion, less than 10%, less than, less than, less than 8% of children in South Korea were poor according to our approach, and relatively small numbers were um, not, sorry, much larger numbers were not poor, up to around between 30 and 40 percent were at risk of poverty, i.e. they were vulnerable to becoming deprived in the imminent future. And it's that proportion that we need to consider if we're thinking about our national poverty estimates. Not enough to say only 9 percent were poor, but a potential 9 plus 30 or 40 percent as well. If you're a policy maker, you want to have some idea as to how do we prevent those, popular, those 30 or 40 percent falling into poverty. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much.